Thank you very much, Vice President Watanabe. I am very honored to be doing not just a BBL with Rieti, but to be doing the first one of this new year. I'm aware that Rieti is celebrating its 20th anniversary, and I would like to commend you and all your colleagues at Rieti and the many friends of the Institute on this channel for the work you have done. Uh, I believe that the Research Institute of Economy, Trade and Industry has been a key contributor to the success, relatively speaking, to other countries of the Japanese economy for the last 20 years. And I think every government needs a strong research-based Team B to think about policies, and Rieti has served that function. I'm very proud personally that I've gotten to interact with Rieti through the years and that my colleague Tashiro Takeshi, who was a visiting fellow at Peterson, continues to work with Rieti as do other friends and colleagues. So again, congratulations on Rieti's 20th anniversary. I am also now turning, of course, to the Biden administration um, and the challenges they face in my forecast of what they are likely to do and what are the political and economic constraints they're under. I will be, I realize everyone who's taking time today, thank you to join us, knows this, but I will say for the record, I am not a member of the Biden team. I am not likely to be nominated for any government jobs at this time. Um, so I am giving you my opinion, but that said, um, I am in touch with a number of people who are either going into or advising the Biden team. Um, so this is well-founded speculation, let us put it that way. Um, to make life easier for people, I have put in slides. So if I may, I will show those. Um, okay. So when we think about the international economic challenges for the president-elect, it's important to realize that the US presidents rarely want to focus on foreign policy, uh, Democratic presidents in particular. And even more rare do they want to put an emphasis on international economic policy. Uh, Trump was a very major exception. He made his trade policy a central focus of his politics and his priorities from the start. And I'll, I'll come back to that. But when you look at what the Biden agenda is and who he has put in at Treasury, Council of Economic Advisors, we are waiting to find out who is at Commerce, but US Trade Representative, it's very clear that recovery from the pandemic and raising incomes of working people are really the priorities, these very domestic priorities. But in the end, events happen, even the US cannot ignore the rest of the world. And so particularly on US-China relations, which of course also involve Japan and trade, they are going to be making some key decisions. I do also want to say and that some technocratic decision-making at the working level remains possible, um, that it's apart from politics. Even under Trump, um, most of the financial services, not just the stuff under the control of the Federal Reserve, and the work and the international regulations in that area, for example, basically continued unchanged. Um, I think it's important to emphasize this. The, the political fallout, as you're all aware, of the insurrection in Washington last week and the vote for impeachment of the president a second time today is very serious. But as you also all know, there are countries that are not democratic, that are unstable, that still make economic policy. And so as seriously as I take and I'm sad about what's happened in the US politics, I will focus on economic policy. And realistically, for the next couple of years, the, the economic policy still will get made. Um, that said, we know that there are significant international issues. We have vaccine distribution and improving pandemic management. We have climate change, which the Biden administration insists is very important to them. I hope that's right. We have regulation and supervision of digital industries. We have the conflict with China. 
And we have increasing concern about taxation of not just digital firms, but multinational. All of these issues are quite important to the Biden administration, and all of them are inescapably international. There are other issues, including the productivity slowdown and the poverty and low and middle income economies that are not inherently priorities for the Biden team, but that they will want to address. Now, in general, even in more normal times, there are political constraints on US international economic policymaking. We, we have, as you've seen, a very divided set of citizens who vote. And as a result, the Congress is very divided. Uh, we do not have the kind of clear majority that the LDP, for example, has enjoyed for most of the time recently in, in Japan. There is a, a fear of threat from China um, that is bipartisan. Uh, Democrats as well as Republicans feel this very strongly in Congress. I think it is somewhat excessive, not because I have any belief that the Chinese Communist Party leadership is good, they're not, but I do believe that their external ambition and their ability to harm the US uh, is more limited than some people think, but it is a reality that it is across the Congress and the executive branch and the intelligence community that they're very scared about China. Um, as usual, there's special interest lobbying. I think a key constraint going forward, which Japan has seen both sides of, is the loss of what I'll call reputational soft power, that the US is not considered as dependable, as credible, as competent um, as it used to be seen. And this is obviously reflected in recent politics, but it's been intensified by how badly we've handled the pandemic as compared to Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, China, Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, and others. I think there are also ongoing constraints from the remnants or the leftovers of Trump's policies. Um, the tariffs that are in place, I fully expect that, as I'll discuss, that the Biden administration will not be trying to bully Japan or the EU the way that Trump did, but they're not going to just rescind the tariffs. I, I wish they would, but they won't. I think also the there still remains this escalation of rhetoric against China and, the Biden administration will not want to look soft. Um, and we have specifically from Trump beyond the, the reputational effects of the US, he has done a lot to hurt the civil service. Now Rieti as part of METI and the various parts of the Japanese government, I know we have a mixed government private sector audience today, but you, know, you have a professional civil service, the UK, France, Germany, Canada, a professional civil service. In the US, we have a professional civil service that is smaller, that gets political appointments much deeper down every four years or more frequently. And as a result, under Trump, a number of departments have lost a lot of very good senior mid-career people, uh, notably the State Department and the Treasury Department. And so this is going to be very difficult. The biggest point, which some of you I think have heard me speak about before, and I did when I was warning how much damage Trump would do when I was speaking back in 2016, um, is that the American president has enormous executive order power. This means that as long as he's doing things that do not affect the budget or the tax rates, he has enormous ability to define how rules are interpreted, how regulations are implemented, how aggressively policies are enforced. And we've seen this with Trump on environmental issues, on some healthcare issues, on labor issues. And a lot of this Biden can reverse the first day. And, and so as Biden announced, the US will rejoin the Paris Accord on climate the first day after, after inauguration. But some of the executive orders that Biden, excuse me, that Trump put in, 
Biden will try to reverse, but there will be contested in the courts. And the courts, of course, have been packed with judges appointed by Trump and by Bush. So the executive order's power is strong, but not infinite. So that is the list of the political constraints. That said, we shouldn't exaggerate or overhype these constraints. The idea that there's this huge backlash against trade or globalization is not held up by the data, um, the voting behavior. It's just not a key issue for most American voters. Sometimes people will talk about wanting to have a, a czar, a, a, a central government agency, like Peter Navarro has been in the White House attempting to do for Trump on trade. This is really unnecessary. The, the current structure can carry out the policy. Um, there's also concern about what you can get through Congress. This is also uh, ex real but exaggerated. Um, we saw that even under Trump, you were able to get not just the US-Japan FDA, but through Congress, the USMCA, the revised NAFTA. So these things can be done. And importantly, we're in an era of very low interest rates. Um, and so the fiscal constraints that would normally be thought of as limiting Biden's room for maneuver are not there the way they once were. And literally in the last 24 hours, Biden has apparently been talking about doing a much larger fiscal package than I had expected. Now, this is my one sort of pretty graphic. The, the, I want to remind people, and I think this audience doesn't need to hear it, but the popular focus is always on these big, heavy things that men do with steel and concrete, you know, fishing and bridge building and cars. But that is just a very small part of what globalization and international economics are about. And it reflects what we would call in US politics, the toxic masculinity of Trump, that he was really literally only concerned with exports of stuff. Um, he didn't even care about exports of services, let alone other forms of globalization. But globalization really should be thought of as a multi-layered, it's a web, it's a number of connections coming together. And trade, while important, is only a small part of those relationships. In fact, it may be the most resilient part, though it gets lots of attention. Trade, in a sense, gets through. What gets more disrupted, and we're seeing this now with Brexit uh, in the UK as an example, um, it's the investment across borders, the, the sharing of R&D, the networks of business people, the recognition of qualifications, the human capital and relationships. These networks are what really matter uh, as much or more than trade to economic growth. It's also that even though politically, and Rieti knows this well, um, economic openness is talked about opening up their markets, somebody else's, China, Japan, US, Mexico. But economic openness is really about what it does to oneself, that closed economies like India, like Brazil, the more closed you are, the more corrupt you tend to be, the less competition. And so openness is about the benefits it brings internally. Now, the news on globalization from this view is not great. For the last 15 years or so, it has been corroding. Uh, in, I use the word corroding in English because it's not just it's advancing or retreating. We have CPTPP, thanks to Japanese leadership. We have RCEP now. Um, we have capital flows going to various places around the world but it is less even than it's been. There are holes in it. In it, it, some places, it's fragile. Um, and so, as I've been writing about for a few years, part of the problem of the American retreat is that it contributes to this unraveling of globalization, this uneven globalization, even though, again, to cite CPTPP, for example, there are places where it progresses. Now, the Trump administration, including the outgoing US trade representative, Ambassador Lighthizer, are trying to claim they were successful in their approach. 
And the fact is they were a complete failure on international economic policy. We basically, everything the economics textbooks said would happen is what happened. When there were tariffs put on, they were paid by the American consumer and to a small degree, American businesses, not by the exporting countries. There's academic studies that document that. The trade deficit, which Trump purported to care about, kept increasing because of the tax cuts, because of the fiscal deficits, and the tariffs didn't do anything to diminish it. Um, when the US engaged in unilateral sanctions or threats, including to Japan, but also to others, uh, all it did was divert trade from the US. It didn't really affect other people's behavior. In the US, uh, corruption and, and cascades of people asking for protection from the protection grew. Um, now, this is partly because the Trump administration is and was corrupt, but this is partly what happens when you have tariffs in place. Uh, the uh, Ambassador Lighthizer tries to talk about reshoring, talk about how much uh, manufacturing jobs came back, but when you look at the tax cuts and you look at the growth, the amount that jobs came back on heavy industry is very small. And we had a huge drop in immigration because of Trump's uh, position, and that did not suddenly create lots of new jobs in the US. So basically, the international economics was shown to be right, but that leaves us, of course, worse off than when we started. Now, this is we have been doing a project at the Peterson Institute called Rebuilding the Global Economy that I hope some of you have seen some of our presentations and memos. I'm going to be presenting a bunch of charts from this. Uh, this is work led by my colleague Simeon Jankov on the charts. Um, so we've just trying to measure how open is the US and, and the, the share of world GDP that's traded has gone up through up till the financial crisis and then basically plateaued, but starting to increase again. Um, but in the US case, it has plateaued and declined. Um, and that decline, of course, was accelerated under Trump. And so the gap between the share of world trade that's in GDP versus the US has continued to widen. The US is relatively more closed uh, than it used to be. Um, additionally, we've seen foreign direct investment in the US decline overall, despite there being this massive tax cut in 2017 that was supposed to incentivize inward foreign investment. And particularly what my colleagues point out is the greenfield investment as opposed to just mergers or acquisitions of established companies has gone way down in the US. And, and this is not the financial crisis. This has been a steady decline. Um, Japanese firms continue to invest in the US. There are obviously many cases, but the US has become less attractive as a destination for foreign and immigration, if we leave out the period of the financial crisis that you had a downturn and an upturn, immigration has gone to a more than a decade long low in the US. Um, we had a, a burst of immigration in 2017 trying to get in ahead of the restrictions that Trump put in. And since then it has declined. And again, this is something where one would like to think the Biden administration will change the Biden administration will certainly be less barbaric and cruel in the way they enforce the laws. They will not put in this ridiculous border wall. They will, I hope, uh, diminish the, the cruel orders that the ICE, the enforcement branch of Customs and Immigration does. But I don't think they're going to initiate immigration legislation, uh, at least not ahead of the 2022 congressional elections. And so if we have executive orders, as my colleague Jason Peterson, Jason Furman has pointed out, you could increase immigration back up towards this 1.3, say, level without changing the law. But it would be very hard to sustain that without changing the law. Now, we've also seen, of course, a collapse in foreign student enrollments. And uh, again, this is, this is just through the data is only through 2018, but of course it's now going negative because of orders put in by Trump. And this is obviously not only a high-end export for the US, but something beneficial in terms of network and influence. And um, 
this is an instance where the democratic views on China are going to reinforce or extend the Trump policies. We have seen Senator Mark Warner of my home state of Virginia, who's an influential Democrat, wanting to essentially kick out uh, all Chinese students from American universities. And there are large areas of technical physical sciences and biological sciences where removing all the Chinese students or other foreign students would be devastating to the workforce. But that's likely to happen. Um, so again, the US is likely to continue, unfortunately, disengaging in this front. In fact, this will probably be worse than the overall immigration. Um, now, Rieti's history, as I mentioned, is distinguished. And of course, Metis is much longer. Um, we have had a situation where it has to be acknowledged that manufacturing as a share of US employment has been declining on trend for basically since the war. Uh, it wasn't just coming off the highs of war production. It has been an ongoing, very steady trend, as my colleague Robert Lawrence has pointed out. We've seen a slight flattening of the trend in recent years, starting well before Trump coming into office. There might be a slight blip here if we get the latest data, but essentially there, there is no turnaround in manufacturing jobs. There continues to be improvements in manufacturing productivity, but not in jobs. And if you looked at Germany or Japan, the data is not that different. It starts at a higher uh, manufacturing share. The slope is a little flatter, but then you do have in those countries as well, these long-term trends because it's about technology. Um, so one thing that is particularly unfortunate that Biden has said is that he will continue and in fact probably extend the so-called Buy American policies, which are restrictions on what U.S. government procurement and state and local government procurement can do in terms of getting services and goods from foreign suppliers. Now, the U.S. currently is doing a lot of markup and it's much less than what the EU is doing, or for that matter, Japan is doing. Um, and certainly in percentage terms, it is far, far less than what Europe or South Korea are doing. But this is, of course, a area where there had been progress in multilateral trade on government procurement and where the US having moved significantly backwards, it's not only deeply costly, as my colleague Gary Huffbauer and Eugene Jung have figured out, um, but that it is bad for the escalation or the continued trade problems. Again, I don't want to say that Biden is protectionist in the same sense that Trump was. He is not trying to destroy the WTO. He is not trying to think tariffs are good in and of themselves, but he is not fully recognizing the decline of manufacturing. He is very much romanticizing to go with his background in Pennsylvania and Delaware, the idea of buy American unionized firms. And so that is going to continue and expand. Um, some of you are probably familiar with this. This is an ongoing, I don't expect you to read all the details on the chart. This is an ongoing tracker of US-China trade that my colleague Chad Baum with some research analysts updates. And as everyone on this discussion knows, the, the targets put out a year and a half ago, say, by the Biden, excuse me, by the Trump administration and the Xi government um, for US-China bilateral trade were crazy. They were numbers that were not going to be met. They required very specific targets in very specific areas. But even then, once you had the pandemic, there was no way it was going to happen. Now, I fully expect the Biden administration to discard most of these um, targets and specific targets, but they are going to try to replace them with efforts to affect Chinese behavior. And this gets into more interesting and frankly, more interesting to Japan um, aspects of, of trade policy uh, that we should talk about. Uh, one thing to note is despite the fear of, J of China and the US, and despite the recent announcements by the Trump administration, as my colleagues Nick Lardy and Tian Wei Huang have pointed out, um, 
foreign investment in China keeps expanding. And you're all aware of the news that the EU has concluded, although not yet ratified, this uh, investment treaty, bilateral investment treaty with China. Um, the portfolio investment continues to flow and US as well as Japanese and European financial firms want to manage that and encourage that. This level of integration does not seem likely to unwind. Um, it is surprising to me quite how much appetite there is for Chinese assets, given that under Xi, it's very clear that property rights are not terribly secure in China. Um, but nonetheless, the reality is, except for this little bit of tapering right here on the very latest data, um, we are seeing continuing financial integration between the US and China, between the world and China. Um, this is another chart I do not expect you to read. Uh, this is just to show you how complex something is. This is again from my colleague Chad Baum and also some expertise from my colleague Martin Troizemp at Peterson. The, as some of you are aware, there is a review body in the US called the Committee on Foreign Investment in the US and it oversees any foreign direct investment, greenfield, takeover, whatever, uh, in the US. And it's a longstanding committee. It goes back to the early 70s. Um, it was used in various political ways against Chinese investors in the 80s and early 90s, I mean, excuse me, against Japanese investors. Um, and now, uh, starting about two years ago, the law was revised. And importantly, the revision of the law was not a Trump administration initiative. It was an initiative in the Senate. Um, and it was a bipartisan initiative. Democratic as well as Republican senators were pushing it. And it very clearly was meant to be an anti-China law. Um, and again, you can argue whether that's good or bad. But what they did was make it enormously complex to uh, oversee a much wider range of deals than they used to. Um, my colleague, Gary Huffbauer, who's a lawyer, an international economic lawyer, has looked at the data and the, and the details and potentially the number of cases that could be reviewed by CFIUS has gone up between 10 and 50 fold. Uh, we remain to be seen how much this will be implemented. This is an area where the Biden administration is unlikely to reverse anything. Uh, they are broadly supportive of this. We will see who gets appointed at the Commerce Department. The CFIUS, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the US, is an interagency committee chaired by the Deputy Treasury Secretary, but a lot of the work uh, that goes into it and the determinations are done by Commerce Department staff. Um, and it's related, although it's obviously not the same thing, it's related organizationally to the export control regime. This is also clearly a place where collaboration with Japan or the EU is a very interesting issue. Um, a number of allied countries to the US, including Japan, including Germany, including the UK, including Australia, have revised or extended or created um, similar kinds of reviews for foreign investment, none as complex or as aggressive as, as this one. And the, some people going into the Biden administration were hopeful that they could get a common front with Japan, EU, Australia, and so on to deal with uh, transfers of technology. And so I have a common front on dealing with foreign investment, particularly uh, where Chinese firms come in to buy up smaller technological companies, high tech companies. Um, so it did come as a surprise uh, to many of the Biden administration people when the EU announced they were going ahead last month with the bilateral investment agreement. Uh, there's been probably too much attention paid to this, but it's in part because Jake Sullivan, who is the incoming national security advisor to President Biden chose to tweet about it because officially the Biden administration nominees are very carefully not meeting with any foreign officials right now until the inauguration takes place. And so Sullivan felt he had to tweet and get others to talk about it. Um, now, again, this is not the biggest thing in the world, but it is indicative of one, maybe two things. First, that it's very nice that Biden or Kirk Campbell, who's tapped to be potentially a key 
official on Asian policy in the Biden administration, or Jake Sullivan, or Secretary Designate Yellen, Janet Yellen, to say, we're going to work with allies. And of course, that is better for Japan, better for the world. But that doesn't mean it's done. Just saying you're going to work with allies may rule out some of the very stupid, destructive things that Trump did, but it doesn't solve the problem. And the second question, which is talked about a bit now in the press, which we don't know yet, is how much the EU decision, and in particular, the decisions by Merkel and Macron, essentially, to go ahead with the China deal is because they find the US less dependable or reliable, not waiting for to see if Biden changes that. Um, this is another chart talking about the similar kinds of efforts to restrict access to semiconductors. Um, and what is interesting about this, and, and as you've all seen in the news, and probably many people in this call are much better informed than I am, we're seeing disruptions in auto supply chains and manufacturing because of semiconductor disruption. And this is in part, as my colleague Chad Bound and others have been arguing, because the US is restricting us. And I think this is very instructive. It's instructive that where the US picks a very specific, narrowly defined technology, their ability to impose export controls goes up. Um, and it can be effective. But the more important the technology they pick, of course, the more integrated it is into civilian production. And so the economic effects are sometimes unforeseen. And this is going to be an ongoing theme with the Biden administration that, and my colleague Jeff Schott has just published something with Peterson about this in the realm of financial sanctions. So the US Congress, as well as the Biden administration, will continue trying to be, maybe not with tariffs, maybe not with evil rhetoric like Trump, but continue trying to be aggressive in pursuing policies, particularly vis-a-vis -vis China, but also Iran, Venezuela. Um, and they will, to some degree, backfire. Um, now, um, an aspect of this backfiring is work, which I know people at Rieti have done similar kinds of work. This is work done by my colleagues, Brad Jensen and Lee Branstetter, who are hard time with Peterson, but respectively at Georgetown and Carnegie Mellon. And, and they compiled a unique data set looking at the internationalization of R&D among major multinationals. And unfortunately, the data only goes up through roughly 2014. But the trend has been clear for 30 years, 35 years, that the share of US patents going to multi-country invention teams has gone way up. Uh, we cite here a specific example of IBM. And similarly, what we've seen, and this again is work by Brandstetter and Jensen, what we've seen is a, an expansion of the um, R&D being done in what we call non-traditional hubs, basically outside the G7. And this includes China, India, Israel. Um, and our newer colleague, Reinhilde Fuglers from Belgium, has pointed out similar kinds of trends with European R&D. And so, again, I know Rieti tracks this very carefully with Japanese firms. There are going to be ongoing issues of how integrated do you want your research and development to be, particularly if the US government continues to potentially threaten to interfere with R&D and balancing that against the costs of having a, a more limited, more expensive and less diverse R&D chain. And at the end of my talk, and maybe in the Q&A discussion, we can talk some more about how Japan and Japanese businesses, as well as METI, can think about balancing that. But just to say that in the US, this is going to be, again, another place where I expect the Biden administration and the US Congress to continue to be increasing aggressiveness of the sanctions and the constraints with the idea of being this is to prevent Chinese technological advance, but probably not having as much effect as they would like and having larger negative side effects on the US than they like. I'm not going to say that this is necessarily wrong. Um, I think some constraints on, on US uh, access, allowing access to China uh, and other 
uh, potentially hostile powers to US technology is right. But I and a number of my colleagues have tried to tell the Biden people, you want to go for what's traditionally called a small yard, small garden with a very high fence that you pick a very limited number of sensitive technologies and you build very strong restrictions around them. And then you're more likely to be able to get allies, including Japan, to obey those restrictions, uh, to comply, I should say, not obey, comply with those restrictions. Um, and then you minimize the economic damage. They are likely to be more in that direction than the Trump administration was and that some of Congress would have them be, but they are unlikely to be as limited as I say would advise them. Um, another topic, which of course the Rieti and the associate communities on this call talk, think about a lot are these trade deals. And again, I think the US uh, underestimated the will of Japan, Australia and other leaders in CPTPP to go forward and then completely underestimated RCEP um, RCEP surprised, let me say, not too obnoxiously, even me and some of my Peterson colleagues, not that it went forward once India was out, but that it's slightly higher quality than we would have expected. It's obviously not CPTPP, but as trade agreements go, it actually seems more binding, um, more intrusive uh, leveling than I would have expected. And that is, of course, good news for Japan and the other economies participating. That is good news for the developing countries participating. That is good news for China. And I think it is a perfectly healthy development. But I think the one chance the US has to get a Biden administration that's aggressively positive on trade is this sense of the US being left behind by the Asian growth region. That said, and again, we can return to this in the discussion uh, after my conversations with a number of likely or nominated Biden officials, um, I find it extremely unlikely that they will do anything to join or align with CPTPP for at least two or three years. Um, they may try to sub silently uh, try to align, they may try to encourage the UK to join beyond what Japan and Australia are already doing as sort of a strengthening and opening of CPTPP. But the US is extremely unlikely even under the Biden administration to do any trade initiatives. And they pretty much said this. If you read the, the USTR nominee, Ms. Tai, um, they're going to focus on enforcement issues with China, and they're going to focus on, unfortunately, some less important issues of Airbus Boeing and things like that with the EU. Um, now, on the dollar, this is just sort of a sign of my age. I remember when dollar politics were a huge issue, first between US and Japan and Germany, and then between US and Japan again, and then with China. Right now we're in a situation, this is based on work by my colleague Joseph Gagnon and Peterson, we're in a situation where the currency manipulation is not a legitimate charge by the US against China, let alone Japan. There are a number of smaller economies that are doing it, in particular Korea um, merits attention because it's not so small. Um, and if you add up the amount of current account surpluses bilaterally, that they have and the official flows causing those surpluses or contributing those surpluses, it does add up to real money. Um, this is in the hundreds of billions of dollars. Um, and a lot of it is vis-a-vis -vis the US. So this is something where I think Japan can be relatively calm, but there will be attention put on this. We had the bizarre spectacle of last month, the U.S. Treasury saying they were going to sanction or at least have extended consultations with Vietnam as a manipulator and Vietnam, of course, as an economy is tiny. Um, it was all kind of absurd. Switzerland and Korea in particular are going to be coming under scrutiny, though. The rumored nominees for the assistant secretary job at Treasury are, are currency warriors. Um, I think in the end, Janet Yellen as Treasury Secretary will not make this a priority unless either Japan or China 
breaks the G20 agreement on unilateral intervention, which there's no signs of them doing, you doing. Um, but I do think the potential for Switzerland and Hong Kong, well, Hong Kong obviously, and South Korea to have a problem with the US over this are going up. Um, that said, there's gonna be a fundamental hypocrisy because they're not gonna do anything to Taiwan under the current circumstances. And if you're not doing anything to Taiwan, how do you do something to Singapore or Korea? So uh, in the end, I, I think the currency issue will remain very much on the back burner and not a major concern so long as Japan and China continue to adhere to the agreement, which they will. Um, so finally, let me try to pull together some of these things. Can, can President-elect Biden state the priorities of creating good jobs, growing manufacturing, increasing security vis-a-vis -vis China, and enforcing U.S. values abroad be achieved through some kind of international economy? And as I know, Rieti has advised Japanese governments and Peterson has advised Japanese and American governments through the years, uh, international economic policy can only get you part way. Um, some of these goals are better pursued with domestic means, with multilateral means, rather than the kinds of policies that are being proposed. Um, as I mentioned with the example of the uh, investment agreement with Europe in mind, Cooperation with allies is good, but you need to have actual common pursuits with mutual benefits. Now, um, with regard to the legacy of METI in particular, I remember talking with former Vice Minister Yasa, Yanase Tadao when he was Vice Minister. You know, Japan played a huge role in, uh, I believe it was 2017, at the WTO ministerial in Argentina. Um, and there was a draft agreement between the Japan, EU, and the US, it was 2018, I apologize, um, on what a subsidies approach, a common multilateral subsidies approach could be done in international trade with vis-a-vis -vis China. Um, that text is still there. It's a very good text. Um, and I personally and others have been encouraging the Biden administration to just simply pick that up and make that one of their first agenda items in this sphere, having Japan and the EU and the US come together on that. I think that is very much under consideration. Um, and the Biden administration certainly will not be um, threatening to blow up the WTO or withdraw from the WTO the way the Trump administration did. So there is some hope along that line. I think it diplomacy is to play for to see how far that goes. But I have to be clear that even um, ex-Obama officials and forthcoming Biden officials, which overlap, who I've spoken with in recent weeks, their negative views on the WTO, particularly on the multilateral trade rounds, but also on the appellate body, to me, are surprisingly strong. I was very aware that in the second term of Obama, um, US trade, then US trade rep Michael Froman and his team were very frustrated um, with the WTO, um, but it seems to have carried through. And so I think pitching this proposal to the Biden administration as an allied effort by Japan, EU, US, that is WTO compliant may work, but pitching it as the basis for new multilateral efforts will probably not. Um, and this comes despite the fact, as we've documented, that the U.S. tends to win its WTO cases. Now, um, obviously for Japan, but for the world, U.S.-China relations are central. And, and I, rather than just think about it as aggressive or not from the U.S. approach, I would encourage you to think about there being three sort of buckets, three collections of issues. There's the issue represented by the Pentagon, uh, which is the issues of confrontation with China. And this includes things like the treatment of human rights in the Uyghur territories and of Muslims in China, the safety of Taiwan. Uh, on the other extreme, represented by the green circle, are the issues of cooperation. And climate change is clearly the foremost issue that the Biden team wishes to cooperate with China on. Uh, they feel that the Obama-Xi efforts on China, excuse me, on climate change during the first term of Obama were, and second term, uh, both terms of Obama, excuse me, um, 
were successful and they'd like to return to that. Um, and they've been very clear um, that they essentially want to raise both the confrontation on issues, some issues and the cooperation on some issues. And the Trump approach was actually the mirror image of this. He didn't bother to try to get cooperation. He certainly didn't care about climate change. He wasn't principled in talking about confrontation with China. Um, he obviously encouraged Japan's self-defense efforts and the military relations between US and Japan proceeded, but he was not exactly confrontational with North Korea or China. And instead, this middle bucket of economic issues where it's not all or nothing, it's negotiable, um, were elevated to the center. And so the Biden approach is going to be some combination of diminishing the center economic issues and increasing the importance of the other two buckets. But I fear they're going to try to overuse the economic issues as an incentive structure, particularly on the confrontation side. And I think it would have be better to depoliticize it and use it to use a nautical analogy as ballast, something to steady the ship if you largely leave the economic to go ahead. But I don't think that's where it's going to go. Um, there are a number of play areas where we can think about simultaneous common effort. As I said, talking about treating allies as allies is, of course, welcome and necessary. But there's plenty of room for what Maury Obsfeld and I have referred to as mutually binding and beneficial changes in government behavior. Essentially, we want to get away from the 1978-1985 Plaza Accord models of summits, where it's US promises to do one thing and Japan promises to do something else, or US promises to do something now if Japan does something in the future, vice versa and just keep it focused on areas where all the participating countries are moving in the same direction at the same time. And we had examples of this during the global financial crisis, during the G20 summits of 2009, 10, 11, at which time I was a minor uh, advisor to Gordon Brown, and I'm proud of the success it's made. But we've also had it with the agreements with China and G7, including Japan, on currency since 2012. And we had it just this past year at the start of the pandemic economic shock when all the central banks agreed on swap lines of the Fed. And there's plenty of potential for this on vaccines. Again, the idea is to pick areas where the commitments are largely the same and simultaneous, not as one's the locomotive now, one's the locomotive later, which tend to fall apart. Now, I think the question for Japan, and I gave a similar talk to um, British government agency earlier in the week, if so for the other free countries, um, I also gave a talk in Singapore recently, not in, obviously, um, the other free market economies, um, is what do you do if the US and China are both unreliable, be it after 2022 or 2024? And I don't think that the Biden administration is unreliable, but I think, as I'm sure you're all having to discuss, you have to recognize that the U Biden administration commitments could be reversed after the congressional elections in 2022, or more likely, uh, depending on what happens after the presidential election in 20. So how can you make the system work when there's more conflict between US and China, when the US contributing to this corrosion of globalization I've mentioned is not uh, consistent or credible in its commitments, and we have an environment of slower growth. And so I think what we want to do is have countries, as was demonstrated with CPTPP, um, countries moving forward and creating different geometries of clubs and groupings um, so that globalization is more modular and it's less vulnerable to an inconsistent China and US. And I published an article last summer talking about what I call principal plurilateralism for Japan and a few others, um, that you are not relying necessarily on the multilateral organizations, but you are basing your pluralist, um, plurilateral efforts on, on principles rather than on political affinities. Um, and Nordhaus, the famous economist, talking about clubs on climate change is another model of this. Um, it's also possible 
when we think about how distorted people's views are of, of, of trade, that they emphasize these heavy goods and agriculture in Japan and cars in Germany, that there are all these other important areas of investment, of financial flows, of intellectual property, of, of business networks, that we can emphasize those progressing and re-knitting even if we can't so I make progress on trade. Um, I just want to do a brief plug for this work that my colleagues and I, Peterson, have been doing on rebuilding the global economy. I hope you will check it out. I've mentioned in particular this idea of a joint EU, Japan, US approach on industrial subsidies. To, I think it's also important to note that the BEPS process, the base erosion profit shifting on international taxes, which is an OECD negotiation, I think that will get surprisingly a large amount of support from the Biden administration. We may see progress on that front. As I mentioned, talking about high fence, small garden on tech controls on immigration. Um, and then there are financial issues I will skip at this time. I think in the end, what Japan needs to do and what we all, those of us trying to affect the Biden administration to do is take advantage of some of the bad news. This is a still from the musical Hamilton that when the US defeated the British Army at Yorktown back in 1783, um, the world turned upside down. And, and COVID-19 and then the events of the last week have shown a lot of usual assumptions about which governments govern best, starting with the US are false. And I, as I, some of you know, I've argued, at least on the economic front, particularly with womenomics, I think Japan has shown itself to be very well governed in economic matters over the last decade plus. Um, we also live in a world where sector stagnation is bad, but it means that the fiscal constraints are less. And so keeping in mind that the Chinese Communist Party is also eroding its reputation around the world, um, I think there is a way for us to move forward. Uh, thank you all very much for your attention. Um, thanks to Vice President Watanabe for inviting me to this talk, and I hope that was of interest to people, and I'm very happy to take questions. <laughs>